Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Mick West. My guest today is Sasha. I met Sasha at the Flat Earth Conference that I uh, talked about in my episode last week. Sasha is a really interesting person. She believes that the Earth might not be a sphere. She doesn't fully commit to being a flat earther, but she is very open to the idea. And she thinks there's a lot of evidence that suggests that the Earth kind of is flat. And she comes across as a very, very intelligent and interesting person with a, a good perspective on the world. Except for this one thing, and a few other things. She believes in a bunch of other conspiracy theories. But uh, I found it fascinating that she could be so so intelligent and aware of the way the world is, and yet so wrong about this one thing. She no doubt will disagree with that characterization, and you'll understand more about that after you listen to her in this episode. So here she is, Sasha. Sasha, uh, I met you at the Flat Earth Conference, which was a very interesting conference from my perspective. You know, obviously I'm, I'm not a flat earther, and uh, it was interesting being surrounded by a lot of people who were either flat earthers or uh, were flat earth curious. Uh, can you tell me what uh, your position is on the shape of the earth? Sure, I can. And it was nice to see you there. I remember that, um, yeah, you were probably one. I think there were a couple other people who were not flat earthers, but... Um, I think it's great when not flat earthers come and mingle with flat earthers. I think it's like a really positive thing. And the more we mix, the better, really. So, yeah, it was was great to see you there. Yeah. Um, I I do identify as a flat earther. I, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how much that label, like, really communicates to any given person like they might think oh you're flat earth you must believe in the dome or you think that whatever Mm -hmm. you may assume all sorts of things um for me it just means i don't think we live on a spinning ball and i came to that conclusion a few years ago in about 2015 and i'm incredibly curious to continue to explore evidence and to just continue to feel what it like to think this and talk to people and mm-hmm. live life right now it's it's kind of a interesting adventure and um yeah so um that's, that's yeah that's that's good that's uh so you said like 2015 was when you kind of first got into it can you remember kind of what was the the tipping point there it was a long time it was um I did, you know, ding, ding, ding. I did watch a YouTube video in the beginning. (laughs) Well, we all all watch YouTube videos. (laughs) So I I did. There was a a short video that I um, had been popping up and I was kind of dismissing it. And then I thought, um, well, I'm just bored enough. Mm. And the thumbnail's pretty. It's like this waterfall kind of idea. And so I just clicked on it. And I thought maybe it'd be like satire, just a little bit of entertainment. And it was a very dry, illustrated explanation of our, uh, I guess, sort of questions to ask about how we perceive the sun Mm. and the horizon and perspective. And I watched it and I just had this kind of like little internal like guffaw, like this kind of laugh or... I, I did realize they were making a good point and it just, it was so, so out of my radar range of anything that I would ever imagine somebody could make a good point about that. I was just kind of, I, I was tickled and I, you know, I came out actually first I, I, you know, I, I Googled the globe. I Googled, I was like, well, wait, okay, let me just review. <laughs> I believe in the globe my whole life. I remember that. Let me just go back and look at it again. I Googled the globe. I Googled the history of our belief in the globe. I actually remember finding this big PDF with sort of like a illustrated history of when they discovered the globe and how, why they believed in it and, and moments of different, um, I guess, confirmations. Or It's been a, a while now. Yeah. I don't remember. But I remember just going back and revisiting 
just sort of just sort of realizing like looking at with a with a critical eye that oh we never really really confirmed it <laughs> like like and it was, it was like okay you know I it's the weirdest thing ever at the time I didn't know anybody who would ever ask this question whatsoever but I was like you know it was it was a real threshold kind of moment because I was like well this is just it's weird. Like, am I going to let my mind ask this question? You know, is mm-hmm. the globe right? Am I going to, am I going to think this thought? Because there's a kind of like a, a, a barrier in me, this instinct of like, I don't, I don't think that thought, like, that's not a thought you think. And I also had the sort of subsequently had this kind of feeling like, well, I can cross a line. <laughs> I can, I can think a thought that I first have this instinct feeling. No, we don't have that thought. And it's only a question. It's not a conclusion. It's a question. And so I just kind of like metaphorically stepped into the question. And I was like, is it really a globe? Are we really on a globe? And it it was, you know, I was like, I've not. So I did a lot of things to explore the question. I did watch other YouTube videos. I came across um, sort of, uh, like hurdles, I guess would be like, okay, so if it's, if it's a globe, then, um, or if it's flat, then, and so one of the early things that I came across was satellites. And, you know, I saw people representing cases that, uh, we're not really using satellites and satellites are just kind of like a, a story we're being told. And I was like, well, I, I didn't really, um, I didn't really know, of course, but I was like, well, how can I test that for myself? Like, how can I personally verify if we have satellites? And I um, I took a field trip to the observatory. I live in Los Angeles. And so I, I went to the observatory and all, all, all like plucky Nancy Drew style. <laughs> I like, took a friend with me and I was like, you know, they have this huge uh, telescope. And so I was like, you know, can I see satellites through your telescope? Mm-hmm. And they said, they said no. And I said, okay, well, you know, can you see them? Is it possible? Like maybe I don't have permission, but is it possible to see satellites through that telescope? And they said no. And I said, well, is it true that the satellites can really see us? And they said, yes, they can read your license plate. <laughs> I, was like, well, what does I think they they're call? exaggerating like, a little. Though. Well, uh, okay. So maybe where they smoke, there's fire. Yeah. But yeah, so well, they told me, that we'd... go ahead. Did they, did they say why the telescope couldn't see the satellites? Yeah, they did. I asked a lot of questions, and they said the reason was because they were moving too fast. Mm-hmm. The, the thing is, though, I, you know, I understand the basic concept of relativity. So if they're moving too fast, then in relation to them, we should be moving too fast. So with the most powerful, you know, I, I explored further. Is it just this telescope, or can we see them with any camera? All these kind of questions. And they said we can't see them from Earth, even though there's these other stories of you can see those glints in light. Yeah. Um, you know, they said we can't focus on them, and and they said we can't see them. So it was the the first time I was getting, first time I was going to a source, and asking a question, and getting uh, essentially like a, an answer that didn't make any sense and felt um, kind of defensive you know at some point they really were just like satellites are real Mm -hmm. like they really just kind of get and of course that wasn't the end of my journey that was only the very beginning but it was just a little moment of like oh I'm further curious I'm further curious like these answers should be um better yeah they should and I I kind of agree and they weren't really giving you very good answers there because from my experience you 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 I don't know if you'd be able to see a, a satellite with the big telescope at the observatory, but there's you know there's two types of satellites. There's the ones that orbit, and then there's the geostationary ones. So the geostationary ones don't move in the sky. So really, you should be able to focus the telescope yeah. on one of those. Yeah, the observatory that because they don't they don't go for that. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I spent about nine months um, doing things like that, mm-hmm. and. Uh, coming to different questions and exploring for and against and just, just re I, I like to do my homework. It's like, it's just kind of my thing. 
And um, I just dove in and I was and I was just went aggressively to any pros and cons. And, you know, I didn't have like a, oh, I want it to be flat or I want it to be a globe or, it, you know, it was I just wanted to. It was just intriguing. Like yeah. what are we really dealing with? And so um, there were there were sort of pivotal moments where I sort of realized certain things that, um, you know, pushed me more towards pushed me more towards not globe to say I ever went like to any kind of flat model wouldn't be true it it really was just that I understood there was a possibility of other models but um I would never say oh you know that e- e- equidistant map that must be right no 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 all, all I realized was that they're very legitimate questions to ask and um I have been putting putting my faith in a body of information that I can't personally personally verify, and I can see major contradictions in. Mm-hmm. What um, would you, what would you say is like if say were someone was coming new to this subject and they were curious about the flat Earth, what would you personally give them as the most compelling piece of evidence that you can personally verify and that, that they could also verify? Well, first, first of all, I'd say, hey, it's a jungle in here out here and you better take your time you better take your sweet time and if you're not convinced of something awesome like this is about realizing that you can discern information for yourself and don't let anybody tell you anything that you don't check on your own and that you don't just take your time to consider don't don't accept anything under pressure don't accept anything because of how it feels like just take your sweet time but some of the reasons that are strong for me is, is actually not even about um, the shape of the earth, but about the spin. And um, so I, I found this chart. It is, you know, where, how fast are you spinning here in the earth? Like it occurred to me, I was looking at a globe and I was like, you know what? We have to be spinning a lot faster at the equator than at the poles. Mm-hmm. because, you know, you got you got to cover a lot more distance in one day. You're at about 1,000 miles per hour at the surface of the equator, and then you're at about zero, <laughs> close to zero <laughs> at the poles. And I was like, well, that's, that's wacky. That's crazy. And so then I, I went to this chart, and I just sort of, like, explored different plane trips you can take. And so I, I discovered that, like, if you went from, like, India to the U.K., that the ground beneath your feet had to slow down by 400 miles per hour. Now, I recognize, okay, like we're including the atmosphere. Okay, sure. So the the whole system could be slowing down at 400 miles per hour. But that's a lot of change in force. That's a lot of adjustment. And I know that you're going to feel your organs like slamming up against your ribcage. Like, now I understand constant force in one direction you don't feel. But any kind of change in force, you do feel. So hugging a curve or slowing down, these are going to give you physical sensations. And I was like, wow. (laughs) You know, I've never specifically taken a plane from India to the UK, but I have taken a lot of plane rides. And I went and did the math for how much the the world, the environment, the earth, everything should be Mm -hmm. slowing down or speeding up during that trip. And I was just like, Oh, I didn't feel that at all. The plane didn't adjust for it. Uh, you know, I, I do, I ride on the freeway. I get off on an exit lane. I, I hug a curve. I feel mm-hmm. that. I got to lean to one direction. I got, uh, you know, I can't take the curve too fast. I'm going to fly off the edge of the freeway. Like these curves, these motion. Well, have people tried to explain that to you? I can tell you about the difference between turning and uh, going in a straight line, basically, because uh, there's linear velocity and there's angular velocity. And, well, th- probably the example that you probably heard before is the example of being on a train. And if the train's going 100 miles an hour, you walk in one direction down the train from one end to the other, and then you turn around and walk back the other way, it doesn't actually feel any different. Well, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But the thing is that a train's going in a straight line. You're essentially you're going in a straight line. Then when you're flying from England to India, 
It's well, not, you're not because yeah, you're hugging the ball. Well, you got the ball. Yeah. Hugging the ball is a curve. I mean, unless you want to say there at this flat, then you can go in a straight line from, from <laughs> England to UK and you win that one. But we got to go with the flat model. All right. Have you ever actually uh, calculated the forces that are actually involved that would be throwing you like to the side or whatever? Um, no, I I haven't in detail. No, I just know that an adjustment of 400 miles per hour is a lot because when I adjust by 20 miles per hour, I feel right. it. So, and I've looked up like how much how much force should the how much speed velocity should the human body be able to handle. And it's less than 400 miles per hour. <laughs> There's like a graphic of like a person on a roller coaster with their face all smushed back. And it's like the human body can only handle so much velocity. Right. So it's like, well, we're out of our limits. You know, we're so out of our limits in many cases. When you say 400 miles an hour, is that the difference in speed between England and India? Correct, yeah. So that's, that's a nine-hour flight. So you have to make you can, you can take your time, but you you have to experience that adjustment. Right, but if you were going faster and faster, if you start off at zero miles an hour and you accelerate up to four hundred miles an hour, that's about the same as as a, as a plane basically taking off, and you do that every time you fly, and uh, it takes about maybe uh, five minutes. And... Well, let me just say this. It should be detectable with yeah. all of our instruments, with all of the, the machine, the counter force necessary when flying right. that plane, it should be detectable. Another thing I experienced is I went also to the observatory and there is the, um, the Foucault's pendulum. Mm -hmm. it's, I've seen was, that. One of my little stops on my journey of research. And so I just, I went there and I was like, okay, so what, what is this demonstrating? What is this not demonstrating? You know? Why? Well, first of all, is a question. Why can something, you know, swing independently? You know, we're supposed to be able to jump and land at the same place. Why is this pendulum experiencing? Why is this pendulum special? But anyway, that's not even. It's like okay, well, it could be special. But I asked the um, the person who's presenting the pendulum. You know, how does this work? Mm -hmm. You know. And they told me there's a big magnet at the top. There's a big circular magnet. And you have to swing the pendulum, and the big circular magnet keeps it going. And without that magnet, it won't swing. Yeah, the, the, the magnet like, keeps okay. it going, but it doesn't actually turn it. That's why well, it's, it's a circular magnet, so it's the same in, in all the directions. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense, like how magnets work. I was yeah. like, okay. And then I'm looking over, and they have a globe sitting on the desk and a little metal ball on a string. Uh, dangling from the globe sort of demonstrating what this Foucault's pendulum is supposed to be and that little metal ball on a string is just exactly staying stationary not swinging at all so you need the magnet it's a it's a I mean well, I you, really... you also need a 200 foot long uh, cable you, you, saw, you saw how big that is it's probably not 200 the actual one in Paris is 200 feet long but the one at, it's Griffiths Park you were at wasn't it the, the observatory there it just, you know, it. These are there's probably like hundreds, hundreds of things I investigated, yeah. but it's just like examples of things that, you know, this should be a lot. This should work without the magnet. This should be real. This should be what it's supposed to be instead yeah. of. It, it does actually work without cartilage. the magnet. Uh, what happens if you take the magnet away is it it's, it gradually slows down because of uh, air friction. You know, like any any mm -hmm. pendulum will eventually slow down. So the magnet's just there to uh, you know, allow it to keep going longer. I think the original one they had when they first did it, they had to kind of uh, tap it occasionally with a hammer or something to keep it going. Why don't they got to tap the earth to keep it spinning? <laughs> uh, you don't, but the earth is a lot, uh, a lot bigger than, uh, than Foucault's oh. pendulum. I mean, like I said, I'm not, I'm not looking to like debate each of these. No, no, it's, uh... Dan, we both have like really strong yeah. deep waters with these. Uh, thoughts and feelings, but um... but I think it's very interesting though, just hearing your take on on very specific things because these are generally things that I, I find it hard sometimes to understand what people are thinking like when they're, they're, they're describing these things. Like when you mentioned the four hundred mile per hour thing, yeah, uh, be difference between uh, the Earth's speed, the Earth's surface speed, at uh, in England and India. 
it took me a while for you to act for me to actually understand what you were what you were talking about there. You can actually Google how fast am I spinning. I right. think I could get the exact chart, but there's a chart. Um, I mean, you can do the math yourself. But you were saying like you would be able to feel like your organs being squished, and but the acceleration to go from zero to four hundred miles an hour over nine hours is really incredibly small. I mean, I don't. Well, we'd have to do the math to figure out exactly what it is, but it's yeah. it's a force, you know. It's it's something. I mean, these are some big, big velocity changes. Right, but you about. probably will ex experience when you when you're flying. You know, obviously, when you take off, you're gonna you feel I mean, those forces. I feel it when I take off uh -huh. in that plane. I feel the velocity of just the takeoff. You know, I lean back. I feel the pressure kind of pushing me back in my seat. Right, I feel it, and that's not that much. To, you know, it like. Comparatively, I should be feeling also the whole system. Yeah, but so the, the amount. Hundreds of miles per hour. Well, it's like five minutes versus nine hours. And then I think you'll probably have to square that to get the actual uh, difference. Well, you you can go ahead I could, and I could do the math. I bet you will. And <laughs> you can put it on meta. That would be awesome. But um, so there's a lot, lot, lot of stuff like that. But there was also the incredible sort of social and media backlash that came. And it started to occur to me that we have a kind of conditioned society to, and you know, I saw a lot of that in your book, I gotta tell you, to, to see this as something to be cured, to see asking these questions as a malady that needs to be corrected. Well, I certainly wouldn't say asking questions is a malady. Uh, I. I feel like people getting the answers wrong is a problem. <laughs> and that's kind of what I feel that's happening with you know, a lot of these things that I talk about in the book. So I, you know, I actually really encourage people to be curious. And I actually think that the flat earth movement is good in some ways because it does encourage people to uh, question things. And also it encourages people to do experiments, you know, doing things like uh, uh, long distance observations and things like that to see yeah, how much is obscured and things like that. Yeah, you know, I, I um, just to pull it back, that was like the first thing we talked about, wasn't it? So you and Nathan were um, having a debate and I actually um, asked a question near the mm. end of it. And I asked you guys to talk about your, what it was like in, in your personal, personal experience of the moment that for you, that you realized you were committed to believing in the globe, and for Nathan, the moment he realized he's committed to disbelieving in the globe. And Nathan answered first, and he gave a story. And um, and then I was, I got to tell you, I was really just asking because I wanted to hear your answer. <laughs> um, because in my mind, most people sort of commit to believing in the globe when they're children, and they, they don't go through any kind of vetting process, but they also don't really realize that. And so... I really just wanted to ask to see what would happen if you, you know, asked yourself that. But you gave a really interesting answer. You said that you hadn't been committed to believing in the globe until you discovered the Flat Earth Movement. And you went through a journey of researching and actually at the, the latter end of that research committed to believing in the globe. And, and I just thought that was... That was really cool that you said that. So Yeah, I started yeah. out, I think, just like everybody else, and that you assume that the world is a globe because you know, that's just the generally accepted thing and that's what science tells us. And I don't think that's a, a terrible position uh, because it's you know, an extremely well-founded belief, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm actually fine with most people not spending a lot of time looking into it. But yeah, if they want to, that's fine too. But yeah, like I said, I started out trying to debunk uh, the flat earth. And uh, I, I basically went through all of the claims that people made, in including some of the ones that you've kind of uh, touched on here. And I, I think I proved at least to myself uh, that these claims were wrong. And so it's just you gain more and more evidence for one position or the other. Yeah. But I, I mean, I gotta tell you, I think that's great. And I think it's fine. And of course I don't have the same conclusion, but I don't think that we need to have the same conclusion. I think that um, it makes for a more interesting existence if we, if we do come to different conclusions and we can continually, um, 
hopefully gently, kindly, um, you know, ask each other questions about mm-hmm. it because there are so many things to question in this world, in my opinion. I know that maybe you don't ask to necessarily think that, but um, I don't think it would be healthy if we all just thought it was flat and we're done with it. Like, it's more interesting when people want to, when people have the time, when it's positive for them rather than negative, to feel free to explore for themselves. Uh, it's, it's great, like, having people questioning things. I'm not sure... You know, if if having divergent opinions on the shape of the earth, though, is a good thing, because from my perspective, Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, I I have such a um, what I feel is such a, a strong and compelling case for the globe, essentially. Yeah. That if people are thinking it's wrong, that's such a fundamental problem. In that, if you think that's wrong, there's so many cons- consequences that come from that. If the earth is in fact flat. That means there's essentially this vast centuries-old conspiracy to trick us. And that, I'm, I'm not saying that's a reason not to believe it, but it's a reason for me personally to fight that belief. Because sure. if, if people are believing in this uh, ancient conspiracy to trick everybody and they're wrong, mm-hmm. then their their way of viewing the world is going to be very, very based on not reality, essentially. And they'll be making decisions both in their lives and in society as a whole that uh, aren't based on a real view of the world and the world's history and the world's power structures. And that goes down to a very simple thing, which is voting. Mm -hmm. Um, If people are electing politicians based on a belief that the world is flat and everything is a lie, that's a very different proposition from people electing politicians based on the belief that just simply, uh, you know, the world is as the scientists say it, and scientists and politicians are just people who are corrupted by lobbyist money. So mm-hmm. it's, you know, we, I feel like we won't be addressing the real problems of things like corruption if we think that it's such a huge corruption that uh, they are lying to us about the shape of the world. I mean, I think this is like a really interesting thing to talk about because I, I saw you talk about that some in your book and... Mm. Um, and sort of I extrapolated from things well, you're, that you're saying now and that you said when we met that you basically are saying you're afraid I'm not going to vote the way that you want me to vote or that other flat earthers are not going to vote in the way that you think is the right way to vote. And um, No, I think, I think it's, it's not that. It's that I think that you won't base your decisions upon the, the way the world actually is. You'll base right. them on a, a phantasm. And so, you know, you could vote whatever you like. I mean, maybe you're a libertarian, maybe you're you're a socialist, or you know, maybe you're uh, uh, whatever you are, like free market, or maybe you believe in you know, market controls. You know, these are all valid ideological differences that we all have. Uh, but believing that there's a you know, ancient uh, order of people who have been keeping us from the truth about the shape of the earth isn't really a political or ideological thing. It's just something that is just flat wrong. Let's just like pull back just a little bit because I haven't said that I believe that. I have said that I don't think our globe model is mm. right. I don't I don't know what it's about. I really don't know what it's about. I do not know that there is what you're describing, some sort of ancient cabal of her. Right. I don't know that. I don't I see that story out there, but I don't know how to test for and against that. Well, I mean you don't think that People have just made a mistake this whole time. Um, I don't know. I just don't know what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. I I just I really don't know. I think that we are like, for example, like I don't personally think that you're some kind of like agent of control. I think that you are sincere in your intentions. I Thank think you. that you have opinions that I disagree with, but um, somebody on the podcast just said he is. So I mean, (laughs) uh, other people have, oh, I definitely am not speaking for all flat earthers. I'm probably not speaking for any other flat earthers than myself. We are an incredibly diverse group of people. And um, there, any, any question, you got different opinions down the road. And also we change our mind as we go. So I could even change my mind but um but anyway i 
I, I do think that you're sincere. Thank you. Um, no, I think you're sincere. That's one of the things that I actually got from the conference is that everybody seemed sincere, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I kind of, I was a little bit, I wouldn't say surprised, but I didn't know what to expect before I went there. And yeah, my, my wife was saying, are you sure you're going to be okay? Are you going to be safe? What if someone tries to assassinate you because you're, you're like, you're, they think you're an agent of the Illuminata. And I was just line. like, no, yeah. that's ridiculous. But yeah, it's, I didn't know what to expect. And but everybody was remarkably uh, nice and friendly. And, you know, we, yeah. we had a good chat and I had good chats with other people. So I, yeah. I think look, yeah, I saw that you all are genuine. And, uh, and I think a lot of the people there saw that I was genuine. And that's a good basis for having a good discussion. It's awesome. So I, I actually, I do want to, um, let's like circle back to this voting thing. Okay. Because I do think it's important to try to talk about like, well, what are the real, what are the real practical fears? Like, what are the real reasons that you think it, it's potentially a bad thing that, for example, I don't believe in the globe. And so, you know, I know that you you are saying like oh I could my my world view could potentially be warped mm-hmm. by some sort of wrong belief system and that that could change well know, that could change my vote or something like that um so it it might that's possible I tell you the most common voting thing that happens for flat earthers is people sort of vote less mm-hmm. because which is um, a problem I think well I want more be. people it's, to vote. Okay, but we're going to vote for the conspiracy model. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you ask for. No, I'm just kidding. Like, so there, there's just different layers of um, what this means. And, you know, I, I know that you, you mentioned that people, like, they might stop caring about global warming or they might, you know, mm. which is, I just want to tell you, like, I don't think you need to worry about that. Like, sure, there are people who do question is global warming um, like kind of a propaganda story, but I don't know anybody who's like, well, then let's let's mess with our environment. <laughs> like the fundamental desire to take care of our environment mm-hmm. remains and is probably ever stronger because we realize more and more that it is up to us, that this world is up to us, that there there are manipulative propaganda messages coming at us. And it is our job to take ownership of our own communities, of our own lives and our own greater world and do the best we can with it and not be manipulated. So you're going to get people who are learning to farm and and, you know, uh, you're not going to get people who are like, let's pollute and let's Mm -hmm. support corporations who want to pollute. Like it's I mean, it's it's a fallacy. I would love to, you know tip you towards letting go of that conspiracy theory that flat earthers are are out to you know damage the environment and not care about people and um vote in some kind of like paranoid destructive way because there's really no solid connection or motivation to make those kind of decisions for um a person who has less belief in a mainstream narrative it's just there's no there's no logical connection there well don't you kind of have a distrust of scientists well i wouldn't say that you know recently i actually befriended uh the spokesperson for caltech his name is spiridon michaelaklis i met him at a screening for the documentary behind the curve that i um hosted a meetup at in los angeles uh film festival and a bunch of flat earthers went there, you know, let's go represent, let's go see what they have to say about us. And there was a scientist in the doc. I don't know if you saw that documentary, but there was a scientist. Okay. So the scientist kind of, you know, was very like kind of good looking, charming guy in a nice shirt, like said um, that basically flat earthers are like kind of like obsessed with re- a refusal to look at the evidence kind of thing. And I, I could feel watching him that he didn't know any flat earthers, mm. that he had so I actually saw him in the lobby, and I um, <laughs> I just put on my plucky hat, and I went over and said hello. You know, I introduced myself, and I said, you know, that I had been doing some organizing of Flat Earthers, and that we would love to have a conversation with him, that we want to have a dialogue with scientists also. And to my delight, he actually accepted my invitation quite graciously, and um, 
we had several like sit down several hours each con- podcast conversations where we brought him into a room and we had a few people in the room and we recorded it and had a full podcast and oh my god like people all over people in the chat and um talking and he at first had the same thought that your wife had that we were gonna like kidnap him and, just... <laughs> and we we teased him you know that like you know thanks for thanks for falling for it you know you you are in danger right. but it went really well and so basically like we just greeted him and thanked him and you know, I had him introduce himself. He's quite prominent. He's a consultant for Marvel for the movies. He gives them their like quantum physics ideas for the Marvel movies. And he's a quantum physicist and he almost won a Nobel Prize and he's he does a lot of speaking and all this kind of stuff. You know, he was he was wary of us, but he definitely was gracious when he showed up and we had um, a nice conversation. And, you know, I, I told him the first thing that I asked him really was, you know, I told him I, I'd seen him make statements in the documentary and I seen him, he had, he had contributed to an article basically reiterating some of the same ideas about us. You know, he, he's being very polite, but he is disparaging to us in these statements that he's made. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I asked him what kind of research he had done prior to making the statements. What kind of research on flat earthers had he done? And when I asked him that, I mean, he almost like blushed, like he, he turned away and kind of had this like pause of like, he, and then he turned back and he, he kind of started rambling, but he did not answer the question. And I didn't press it because just the gesture of him showing up was so much. And I didn't need him to, you know, explain himself. But we, we bridged a place where he, after many hours of conversation where, you know, actually some of the techniques that you talk about in this book, like I definitely used, you know, I invited him to explain many things to us and was very patient before we mm. you know took the turn to explain things to him but um we we went through stages and at, at, you know and he was finally like you guys are super scientists he said he said this to us he was just like i didn't and he wrote me this email with this like incredibly gracious email this apology like i don't want people to judge people like you i've i've been making statements that aren't fair like you you are sincere, you are doing research, you're asking questions, you're doing what scientists should do. He hasn't come to the place where he thinks he has said that he thinks we're right, but he has come to the place where he's demonstrated incredible respect and a desire to collaborate with us because we are now planning an experiment together. And he recently bought um, three of us lunch at Caltech and invited his um, best friend and lab mate to sit down with us um, and he's going to bring in other scientists. And it was just really just an open mm-hmm. forum conversation and a very lively conversation. It was very fun. You know, we're just like sharing ideas and exploring a way to do a collaborative experiment. And this is because I love scientists. My uh, One of my best friend's husband is a tenured science professor at USC. My, my mother was a lab technician. I grew up as a child, like, sitting in a lab, learning how to use pipettes and plotting data. Like I, um, I won the science award when I graduated from middle school <laughs> when I was a child, like my whole school, like I've always loved science and I, I love the scientific method and I, um, I want to engage scientists in this conversation and I have great respect for them. I just, I think there's an obstacle because they, I wouldn't say they on the whole because I don't even know, but we're getting the feeling that there's a prejudice between us. But I think we're starting to bridge that. I mean, I know it's just in little steps, but I personally think we can bridge it a lot and that we can collaborate in these questions. So, Do you think all these scientists, uh, you know, all these mainstream scientists, they all think the Earth is a ball because they have been indoctrinated? Well, you know, I actually talked to Spears' lab mate, who was, whose name was Jose, just when we all sat down, he studies how the eye sees. But um, so that was kind of one of the, the first things I asked him when I just met him a few weeks ago. I was like, well, so you've, you've heard of this flat earth thing. Like, what do you, how do you feel about it? Are you for or against it? Do you even know? And he just started talking to me and he said, well, you know, I learned, I learned it was a globe when I was a child. And I never, I don't think he used the word vetted, but some simile some, mm-hmm. uh, like that. You know, I never like looked at it. I never examined it. I've just been doing all this science that builds on top of it and allows it to be a given. And he's like, and he was just kind of like, so yeah, that's where I'm at. And, and 
which I thought was just incredible. I was, you know, that he came to me with that. I didn't say that to him. I mean, indoctrinated, you know, it has a very heavy word. You, you could say it uh, in a lot of different ways. But he said also, like, there are no scientists out there studying is the ball. Are we living up? <laughs> like they that's that's done. They, we cover that in grade school. People are out there studying how yeah. the eyes, you know, so so realistically, there are not all these scientists who are double checking the ball. People are believing it in the name of science, but not. There are a lot that. of a lot of scientific experiments you can do to verify it. And I know you th you think you're doing scientific experiments to disprove it, but you know there are you know a variety of experiments that, like for example, just looking at the stars and seeing that the stars move in a certain way. And I think most scientists would, if they actually look at the stars and the way they move in as if they are on the inside of a, a very, very large uh, celestial sphere, they will say that you know, the only way this can be true is if uh, you know, the world itself is spherical, or looking at things like the moon uh, and the sun, uh, you know, the moon not changing size, the sun not changing size, and yeah. things going behind the horizon. There's a bunch of very fundamental things, which I brought up in my debate with, with Nathan, and he, he didn't really answer them. And there's a whole bunch of other small things as well. You're you're at a um a really interesting what would what I would consider like a really advanced area of flat earth questions, which I just want to tell you like all these questions are so welcome. Like I, I um I know you've you spent some time in your book kind of like debunking the dome and you know, debunk it all you want. <laughs> like I think that um it's debunkable. Like that you know, surely other people would disagree with me, but it's very, very open for debate how we're getting what we're observing. And so just going, it's not a spinning ball, doesn't mean we know what's going on in the sky. What do you think is going on in the South Pole? Oh, I don't know. You're going to you're gonna take me in a place <laughs> like definitely not my expertise. But right. I do want to say that um, you're a stellarium here. I'm uh, looking yeah. up in your book. So you talked about a stellarium. Mm hmm you were you were discussing like so you can look at the sky and look at the stars and um and you don't even need to really travel yeah. there's like a projection system that you can use that will show you exactly the way the stars and the sky and the celestial bodies look at all times anywhere in the world and that this is a perfect way to test and demonstrate we live on a globe. Now, I'm just looking. I've never used this instrument. I don't know. And I have not studied the stars. This is not an area that I've been, like, deeply involved in. But just my first thought is, if you can recreate our sky perfectly without fail with a projection system, what's to say it's not really a projection system? Uh, it's a pretty impressive projection system if it is. You can zoom in a very, very, very long way. Uh, I, of course, I think I think like you know, there's there's an argument. There's a there's a, a philosophical point of view. I think it's called solipsism, which states that all you can know is what you personally observe, and there's no way of knowing if anybody else is observing the same things as you, or if anybody else has any yeah any kind of perception or or consciousness even. All you can see is what you are seeing. And it's a very you know, self-centered um, philosophical system. And you know, one step from that is just saying that everything in the world is faked for your benefit, like you're living in some kind of matrix, like a literal matrix from the movie Matrix, where it's all a computer simulation. Yeah. So you ask, like, how do we know we're not living in a computer simulation? How do we know this is not projected? Right. I mean, I'm not saying a, a computer. I'm just saying the sky. Right. I'm just saying the sky. I'm not saying you and I are projected or the ground we're walking on. I'm just saying literally the stars, right. literally the, what we see when well, we look at it. That would mean that the sky and the stars are a perfect uh, projection only from your point of view. Because if you if it was a projection, it would, it would only work from one position on the Earth. Because if you moved 4,000 miles further away, you'd be looking at it from a different angle. I mean, I, I guess I don't know the answer, but people do wonder about that. Oh, yeah. I'm, I saw, I've seen interesting discussions about that possibility and it possibly being a way to consider why, um, you if, know, the moon look the same size at all the time. Like, are we just, are we seeing a projection that is based on our position, but other people get that projection based on their position 
I, I gotta say, it's I'm not at all. I'm not. I don't have a dog in the fight. Yeah, I think Occam's razor kind of comes into play there. You're you're creating something now, which is this incredibly complex and something completely beyond the known laws of physics, uh, just to explain away something that could be explained far simpler with the actual well, real I would, model. I would I would actually really disagree. I think that a projection is far simpler. I mean, but how does the projection create... work? When we want to create a model of the sky, mm. we use a projection. We don't recreate a model of the sky. We don't like manifest gravity and and celestial bodies circling around each other and like perfect rotation. We don't we don't do that. We just make a projection and tell well, a story about how gravity works way out there. So um, what is simpler? You know, if it's your job mm -hmm. to to basically illustrate what you're seeing and you use you instinctually use a certain method which is the projection it sounds uh, simpler but it, it's really not actually simpler because you then you have to explain how the projection is working and this is something that you know, couldn't really couldn't really work with our unknown laws of uh, physics and optics and everything like that you have to any, invent an entire new reality to explain it we already have a working model of the solar system and the yeah you know, the, the nearby universe which works just fine. All the math works out like Stellarium. Stellarium is a software program. It's just uh, a thing you run on your computer and you can make it look up in the sky and it'll show you what it looks like. So this is just using the standard model to show you what the standard model looks like. So now you're taking that and you're adding up an, a whole extra layer on top of that. You're saying here we have a standard model, but it's actually all being simulated and it's created using this projection system, which changes based on where you are, and yet is incredibly, incredibly detailed. So you can zoom in on the moon and you can see the craters of the moon. You can zoom in on, on galaxies. You can see the, uh, the phases of Venus. You can see like the moons of Jupiter. I, just to interject, I do think it's very interesting that we can zoom in on the moon and see the details. <laughs> because why a, a camera has a focal range that should not give us the distance the moon is supposed that's, to be. That's not correct. Uh, the focal, focal range isn't a limiting factor. Uh, the limits come from the size of an object and how, how much light is coming from it. The moon is very, very big. And it is uh, quite bright because it's illuminated by the sun when you can see it. And so there's no reason for you to not be able to see the... No reason for you for the, the moon to be beyond any kind of focal range. Well, I'm I'm very very happy to agree to disagree. <laughs> but um, well, no, no, I it, it kind of it frustrates me. I have a sudden bit like when you say things like the the focal range is. Uh, well, just be frustrated. I, you know, I I don't yeah I don't I don't mean I'm like angry at you, but it's I okay. it's just it makes me oh why can't I explain this because it's well uh, you know can I tell you some frustrations that I have okay, in sure. a gentle kind way? So I read your book. Okay. And I. Skip the chemtrail portion, but uh, and the false flag portion just for time because okay. they're a lesser priority. But I read the first half and then I read the latter half, and um, I've been like underlining passages and photographing them and posting them in flattered mm. chats. Like, <laughs> and, like it's it's been kind of a party for me just for a couple days because some of these lines are just um, gosh, it's like so I have like a range of reaction to it. And um, I I do see your like your good intentions and your heart comes across, especially in like the autobiographical section, and where you talk about um, we even you know remember I asked and you said yeah that part's in the book we talk about being a child and um, hmm. having having these stories that that really scared you and then realizing that the stories were fake and. Um, and having this sort of desire to save people from the fear that wrong stories can give them. You know, I really relate to that. And I was just talking to other to some other flat earthers before I got on the phone with you. And I was like, it's pretty amazing. We actually have the same goal. Like we actually all want the same thing. We want to free each other of the fear that misinformation you know, the, that bad crippling fear that misinformation gives us, we want to free each other of that. We just have very different philosophies of how to go about doing that. And I was thinking it's kind of like you, to me, 
<laughs> I hope this isn't offensive. I really no, don't want to. I, but, um, I welcome you, any feedback. So in the beginning, you talked about using the term um, conspiracy theorist, yeah. and you kind of like went over it for a while. Like, I know some people won't like it, but it's the best we got, and it's not really that offensive. And so I was like, okay, fine. You, I don't know if I would ever call myself that, but I'm not going to be offended. But I was like, well, mate, can I think of a term to call him? And um, I thought of a few. I thought of mainstream fundamentalist. I don't know how that resonates with you. Or <laughs> CNN literalist. Because, you know, I know maybe you wouldn't identify, but it is a descriptive term of what I see, um, what I see you doing. And that is to confirm the mainstream story. Or, or you know, you told me that, for example, when you saw a passport, um, the story of a passport falling from the crash yeah. at 9 World Trade Center, yeah. World Trade Center, that you were like, and I was like, do you really believe that? Because that to me is like kind of like the epitome of uh, let's question something. We should question that. And and you, you responded to me with, you know, in the range of possibility, there is a possibility that could happen. And so, yes, you think it's true. And to me, I was like, well, how do I talk about like what is what is yeah. that and and so i came up with cnn literalist like, to the idea of like taking taking them at their word a kind of um if they say it it must be true it's not a cheat it's not a summary it's not just a lie or a, an embellishment they said it so it's true i would i would disagree with with that okay. because uh okay. you know i i'm not setting out to prove a particular thing is true I'm setting, okay. I'm setting out to see if, if anything is true, to see. So what I do is test claims. I'm not trying to prove the opposite. I'm trying to see if, you know, what somebody is claiming is true or not. Mm -hmm. some, some people are saying, like, you know, the, the, with the passport thing, I've actually tried to do experiments with, with passports. Like, I, I got an old passport of mine, and I did things like soaking it in kerosene to see what effect it would have. Yeah, because they, they said it smelled of kerosene, but it looked fine. Uh, and if I, yeah, if I had a bit more space here, I would be blowing up a passport. I su suggested this to a guy on the podcast, uh, like a couple of weeks ago that, uh, you, if people think that a, uh, a passport can't su survive an explosion, then why don't you test that? Why don't you demonstrate it? If it's such an, it, it's something that seems implausible that a passport couldn't survive you know, running into a building and a giant fireball and then flying out the other side. But we also see bits of paper surviving uh, all kinds of air crashes. I mean, I don't know. If you end up being right about that, I will like, uh, <laughs> I'll do something. Like, I don't, ultimately, I don't know. But, um, but I think we need to go beyond just personal incredulity, though. You need to actually try to not just say, oh, it sounds amazing, so it must be false. You've got to think about the actual physics involved and even do some experiments. Like, uh, has, any, has anybody yeah. ever done an experiment blowing up a passport to see what effect it would have? Yeah, you know, that the explosion was like 40 feet behind them in the fuel tanks and they were in the nose and they were they had some forward velocity. So, well, I'll just say this. I don't think it's crazy to question it. No. I don't think it's wrong to I think it's... I agree because it seems ridiculous and you know there was yeah. a there was a bandana found at the flight 93 that looks like pristine when you look at it in the the, the evidence photo so there are these things that kind of stand out uh, you see you know there's lots of bits of evidence that people point to because you're always going to find something that yeah. is a bit odd it's like but a, you know I, I do think it's okay I think it's okay to agree I think it's okay to disagree I you know I'm mm. I was from the beginning, I was prepared to retract. I thought you were going to like kind of maybe object to my labels that I got for you. But then I was going to be like, okay, we, I'll take them back. But then, and then I'd like to talk about the conspiracy theory label. Okay. Be um, so I see, uh, you know, I saw a lot in your book of like sort of stories of hearing how people, um, have sp you call it falling into a rabbit hole yeah. and um, being sort of lured and duped and confused and and all this kind of stuff i gotta tell you i think that stuff really happens i don't disagree with you i think you are observing a real phenomenon i think that the sort of what you might call it like conspiracy theory world out there on youtube especially for the past few years or whatever is just laden with deliberate misinformation and crafted narratives um, to lore 
I, I think that you are right. However, I don't think that's the whole story. I think that those are there as kind of a um, a barrier, like a like a um, a bramble bush wall, mm. to prevent people from finding comfort and clarity in asking legitimate questions and going on a pursuit of uh, continuing to pursue those questions. So, I kind of see what you're saying in this book in terms of like help ways to help your friend out of believing in conspiracy theory. I think you're right. And I think you're wrong. I think that they're like, yes, like there are going to be people who just get confused and incredibly stressed out and thinking that like Alex Jones is right. And that there's going to be like Jade Helm and whatever. And like just fear, Mm -hmm. fear is going to be overwhelming And it is positive to be supportive of them and maybe give them a path out of that fear. Because there's this guy called um, Quantum of Conscience. It's a channel that I actually really like. I don't agree with everything he says, but he's almost like on the very other spectrum of you. Where he also talks about like kind of letting go of a lot of conspiracy theory. Like recognizing that something was weird is going on and journeying through it if you want to. But also coming to a place where you 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 realize you can't quite figure it out, and it's okay to let go and not try to figure it out. But he also specifically talks about something called graduated animal farms is a term he hmm. uses. And what he's talking about is somebody like Alex Jones, or you know a lot of a lot of figures like that, where like if you talk to if you came on this podcast that's. I think eavesdropping on our calling hour, or if you talk to like a lot of flat earthers who are kind of like what you might call like deep in it, they wouldn't listen to Alex Jones for a second. They know it's been manipulative hogwash. They know it's like a a trap, a mind trap. And it's, um, I don't know what it's really there for. You know, it's, it's there to, I, I do think they tell you some legitimate questions to be asking about the news and they point out, legitimate issues with official stories and then they take you on this wild ride of just bad energy bad you know they 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 hijack you into this sort of incredibly offensive path where there's no calm and and no sort of like positive route out of it I'm, i'm sure i'm sure it's It's just like this middle area where they're giving you some legitimate questions and a whole bunch of narrative lies. And um, that is that is a real place that people can go to in conspiracy theory. But that is I think what there's a difference there is that it's conspiracy theory where people come up with sort of a theory of what's going on. For example, like this Jade Helm sort of like danger situation, but from the government ever. But it it's a story that maybe you can debunk and that would be great for a lot of people. But just because you can debunk it and just because it's a fabricated story meant to lure and create paranoia and fear doesn't mean that the stories CNN is telling us are true. And so this is the idea of the graduate animal farm that you, you realize CNN isn't always telling the truth. And so you land in this other gated world like Um, Alex Jones and you get you get exhilarated you're like oh my god I'm breaking free from something Mm -hmm. and I have this world and all this so that kind of weird exhilaration you're right you're right there's a problem but I don't believe the solution is to just go right back to CNN and and forget about it and fall in line and be safe again I believe the solution is to diversify even more in the exploration and the questions, if you choose it, the solution for some people, not for everybody, I think it's totally fine. If you want to go back to CNN, you do anything you want, but the solution for some people, the healthy solution for some people is to keep going and to keep um, diversifying in the ideas that they're exploring and the people they're considering listening to and in speaking for themselves and in having dialogue with each other because, um, there may be many wrong answers out there, but just because there are many wrong answers doesn't mean we go back to the first answer. That's a fascinating perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I can see there's, there's a large degree of truth in what you're saying. And 
yeah, for me, it's it's kind of weird, like hearing someone who is a believer that the Earth might not be a globe and might be might be flat, and hearing you talk about uh, yeah, so essentially, so intelligently about the state of public perception of uh, you know, government you know, propaganda, for want of a better word. So yeah, um, and I think you know it's really. Uh, you know, what you're saying has a large degree of truth in it. But from my perspective, again, like I said earlier, it, it really grates with the fact that you have all these questions about, not, 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 that, not that you have questions, but you have these wrong beliefs, from my perspective, in uh, the shape of the earth and the physics and things like, you know, acceleration and perspective and things like that. And, uh, you know, I kind of wish, I don't want you to not question things, mm -hmm. but I just wish there's a way of kind of, you know, getting past this. Do you, do you ever think that perhaps, do you, well, I don't want to make you think that I'm making stuff up here, but do you ever think that the flat earth movement might be, you know, part of something uh, negative? Like someone's actually promoting flat earth for negative reasons? I've thought it many times. I will think it again tomorrow. Absolutely. There is weird, weird stuff. Everyone, every, all the time, it's like, is this a deliberate rollout? Like, why? There does seem to be some kind of infiltration and, like, misinformation um, all over the place. And um, so, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But um, I think it's a mixed bag. I think that there are, because I have taken so much time to personally explore these questions. So there are. There are things like I've just I've, I've let go of the globe model, but I, I just don't know where we really are. I just don't know what we're really dealing with. You do some experiments coming up. We do. Yes. It's going to be hot and crazy, but you are totally invited. I, so I would come down. Is it salt and sea? The salt and sea. Yeah. And it is on Sunday. We're going to be starting very early Sunday. I mean, I'm like, I see the whole conversation, but like the experiment, I just kind of sit back and enjoy it. Yeah. But um there are several others who are like deeply involved in, uh, you know, figuring out what the experiments are going to be, deciding, deciding what they're, and using your math. Um, yeah, they are. I actually just updated my curve calculator today because I was uh, wa I was watching a screencast with Jerrynism. Well, I uh, hang out with yeah. Jerrynism, the you know, flat earth guy. Think Jerrynism should be there, actually. Yeah. Yeah. People uh, would love to have you there. I know that. I, no, yeah. I, I would, but he actually lives near B. Maybe we could carpool on the way down. But uh, I, <laughs> I, I, re I really couldn't do it because I'm a little bit too busy this weekend. Uh, sure. But yeah. uh, uh, I updated the curve calculator. I have this curve calculator on my website, which everybody uses to work out what the globe says should be. And I've added a note that says uh, these refraction results are not accurate for horizon skimming observations over water. Because people are always using the curve calculator and they're doing these 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 calculations like over lakes, which it just doesn't work for. So I've added added that and I'm sure they'll notice that at some point and uh, we'll see what the response is. But I'm, I'm hoping it'll get them to think about it. You know, why are why are these observations not valid over water? But, uh, that's kind of a topic for another day, and uh, well, yeah. we've we've been going for over an hour now, and I think yeah, you know, I think that was a very good, uh, very good series of points that you just made there, and uh, yeah, I think it give people something to think about, and yeah, you know, I know you don't want to get into any big debunking or anything, but maybe some other time we could discuss some of the uh, physics and math type issues that you raised, like the acceleration going to India and things like that. Sure, let's but, let's get specific. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And... Thank you very much. Wait, let me ask you: Have you okay. had conversations like this before with flat earthers? Is this new for you, or something you've done before? This is uh, probably the most extensive general conversation I have. I have talked to people uh, in a, a variety of hangouts, but they tended to be a bit more adversarial. Uh, yeah. the Nathan Oakley, uh, you might know him. He's a very okay. uh, shout, shouty type person. Uh, sure. yeah. And Anthony Riley in the UK, I've uh, okay. talked to him. Uh, but yeah, it's great, great talking to you. And yeah, the other people at the conference, like Nathan Gonzalez, very nice guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and just um, I think it's it's good to have a productive dialogue rather than. A fighting adversarial dialogue. I feel so too. I think it's wonderful. I really appreciate your invitation. I appreciate your whole way of 
talking to me. I think it's great. I appreciate it. Okay, and thank you very much. You've been listening to Tales from the Rabbit Hole, Episode 8. 